Money Matters is brought to you by Stanbic Bank. Moving forward. Hello and welcome back from the holiday season. I certainly hope you had a peaceful one, but more importantly, made the most of it. Let's get straight into the business of the brand new year. Now, on Sunday, Southern Sudan embarked on a journey that many anticipate will lead to the creation of Africa's newest nation. The business community here in Uganda is collectively holding its breath as it hopes nothing goes wrong given the growth insignificance of the semi-autonomous state as Uganda's key export destination. We'll be getting into that a little later. For now, you're watching Money Matters and here's what's coming up in the program. The cost of Uganda's uncoordinated real estate sector growth. franchising, and how it can make you money. And the story of a female entrepreneur who beat all the odds to stay afloat in business. But first, Uganda's real estate sector is today the country's fastest growing industry. Sector players are, however, less enthusiastic not about the growth posted by the sector, but the manner in which it is happening. To some, the sector remains uncoordinated, unregulated, and too informal to attain its full potential. Vincent Agaba, the CEO of the Association of Real Estate Agents in Uganda, believes the regulatory vacuum might actually lead to a bubble burst that might see all the gains attained over the years lost. He's our guest in this week's View from the Top. Uh, housing is the traditional name of you know, shelter for every human being. And we understand from the, hum the evolution of humanity, there were two basic services or industries at that time. That's the food industry and the housing industry. Now, when we qualify the housing into the commercial side, that's when we come to what we call real estate. And just for the benefit of the viewer, real estate uh, usually has three pillars. The first pillar, okay, I'm not naming them according to priority, but I would mention the real estate development. And then we have the housing finance, which is the mortgage. And we have the real estate management and agency. That is the marketing side and the management of properties. So when we go to the challenges which have face, been facing the real estate sector in Uganda, first of all, I will look at the regulatory environment of the real estate sector. If you look at the development and the growth of the industry, it is moving upwards, but we don't have the guidelines as a, as a country on which to run the real estate. Developers are not regulated. The managers and agents are not regulated. And the only aspect which has been tackled is the mortgage, whereby we have a mortgage act. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is the gap in information and data. That is research and development. We see a lot of developments taking place, housing finance coming into the country, credit lines all pushing into the construction industry as real estate. But the information which is capturing the demand and supply is not well addressed. And therefore, we see a lot of investments coming in and not addressing the real you know, housing deficit within the country. And everybody keeps talking about the housing and deficit. That is because we don't have data and information which investors can rely on to make what we call you know, practical investments that solve or address the consumer's needs. Now, we've seen real estate taking a very prominent place uh, nationally. Uh, this is the politics season. We're going into elections. A lot of politicians have talked about the need to address the housing gap and to develop the real estate sector. Even government has talked about this. Do you think enough is being done by government to address the challenges that you are facing? It is true the government has done its part. The regulatory guys are working very hard at the Ministry of Housing and they are putting interventions. For example, uh, the ministry is very in support with the association's issues to do with, for example, the multiple listing of the service. We have seen they are watching on what we call the registry system at the Ministry of Lands, such that the land system can be automated. 
Those are all issues. We are looking at the government, tax. They have moved the tax of property from 5%, now it's tax exempt. All those are efforts of government to give a push to the real estate sector. Yeah. So they are doing their best. But what we are calling upon, they have passed the Mortgage Act. We want also the others to be regulated, the development and the real estate agency and management. Because they work in unison. They cannot work without the other. Yeah. Let's talk innovation here. Um, and I'm talking about the fact of the develop about the developments that are being put up. I mean, if you go into downtown Kampala now, more than 90% of the buildings that are going up are all shopping malls. Um, is there nothing that can be done? Is this the only type of product that uh, people want? Are we being innovative enough? Yeah, the innovation we are still lacking very much, I must tell you the truth, because if you look at the prices of properties, one of the indicators or one of the most factors which is affecting these prices is the methods of construction. And that one immediately questions the innovativeness of the industry. We need innovativeness in terms of the low-cost housing technologies. We can talk about the stabilized, you know, interlocking stabilized block systems. We can talk about prefabricated houses. All those can be issues to be looked at in order to lower down the cost of housing. Now, when it comes to the product mix, that is in terms of should we build shopping malls or should we build commercial high-raised buildings? So that is also another way of innovation, you're right. The point here is people are trying to do what the neighbor is doing without, but all that goes back to research and development. So it means investors, people who have the money, they have realized that in the real estate industry there is money. What they do is that they come and bring the money, they bring the people they want to build, but they don't build best on the market. And therefore, what we are getting in Nichikubo or those upcoming shopping mall areas, everybody is putting up a shopping mall. But at the end of the day, they are targeting the same client. But if there was a mix, because these people who occupy these malls have other services they need, they would be need for a first block within the mix, for example, somewhere. Or if that, does, that affects zoning, then we need to see that the government or the KCC or whoever is involved is he or she able to determine and say, look, guys, we need this amount of fixing space. And therefore, this is enough. You talk about banks and banks providing finance. Do you think that they've come in aggressively enough to support the need to develop the real estate sector? No, banks have done their part, and I think they are trying their best. But the problem is the long-term finance, which we have not been able to access in the industry. And that one is associated with the risks within the economy. So the banks cannot get cheaper money to come and lend. But of course, banks have also done their best. They have had like Housing Finance Bank recently, you know, rolling out a very good product. But the money needs to be cheaper. But also that has to be done using the data. I emphasize in this that we need information. Because for a, a financial to give money, they need to be sure or certain about recouping that money back. By all preliminary indications, Southern Sudan will, by the end of January, be an independent state, the newest in Africa and the world. For the first time, Uganda stares in the eyes of opportunity, but also possible problems emerging from this new state. Overhung from the shadow of poor trade relations and negative experiences for Ugandans in Southern Sudan, this is indeed a new beginning for Southern Sudan as it is for Uganda. Insight this week looks ahead at how money can be minted from the autonomous southern Sudan. From Sunday the 9th to 15th of January 2011, it is hoped that history will be made when southern Sudan becomes the 55th country of Africa. If southern Sudan were to become a sovereign state, Uganda is most poised politically and even ethnically to benefit economically. Independence of Southern Sudan is going to be a big opportunity for Uganda, even more than the markets we've already had. We will now have uh, a political regime that is the best friend of Uganda. When this country helped Southern Sudanese to get their independence, there is that link. In addition, there is 
a relationship which is sealed by blood. They are neighbors. If you have ever gone to Kitu, huh? the Southern Sudanese people are really belong. They have relationship, strong relationship with Ugandans in Kitugman and Acholiland. Numbers show that trade has generally been growing from just $91 million in 2006 to $157 million in 2007. There was a surge in trade in 2008 to $246 million, returning to $184 million in 2009. Notable is that the above numbers are collective for Sudan as a country, even though the larger part, according to analysts, goes to southern Sudan. At the moment, you have improved infrastructure linkage between southern Sudan and Uganda. You have integrated the two economies very smoothly and very orderly. The Juba Nimule Road is under construction by the government of southern Sudan, while the Gulu Nimule Road is also planned for tamaking with funding from the Japanese government. Plans for a Lere line from Pakwachi to the Sudan border have also been mooted, though not implemented. I cannot see southern Sudan reaching Khartoum cheaper, forget about politics, cheaper, economically cheaper than they would do to reach Kampala and Mombasa. Petroleum in southern Sudan, Uganda is putting a refinery here. There is that opportunity. Would it be closer? for southern Sudan to supply, uh, to, to supply their crude to the refinery in Uganda than the refinery in Khartoum. That is a decision that the Sudanese government has got to take, but it seems to make sense. I think we are closer. The government believes the private sector is ready, but the recent experience shows that the government of Uganda must help the private sector because southern Sudan lacks the institutional capacity plus the experience to yet fully function. As a state, you go, an officer says you go, some other officer says you can't go. You go to court, they decide this role should be released. Officers say it is not going anywhere. So, these kinds of things we don't expect them any longer. To the trainers, the Ugandan government has baggage from outstanding issues unresolved, pegged on the passing of the referendum. The Ugandan government has not resolved many conflicts that we have between the southern Sudanese because they think the relationship between Sudan and Uganda are remarked. Nevertheless, rough and tough as it may be, to those with a tough skin, the existence of opportunities cannot be denied. It will be a good partner for Uganda. Our investors will have the first opportunity to be able to invest in southern Sudan. We also are very lucky to be so educated, and southern Sudan is not. This is a huge opportunity for employment for Ugandans at all levels, be it the doctors, the nurses, the teachers. If southern Sudan became a country, as much as a beginning it is for them, it would also be the start for her neighbors, especially Uganda, that is most poised to benefit the way Kenya did when Uganda had just emerged out of conflict in the 1980s.